The idea for tonight's meeting has been stewing in the back of my head for a long time, but I didn't have the role to be able to put it together. But I'm so excited that we are able to do it. And the fun part about it is I asked MJ separately from Smita asking Deb, and it turns out we thought we were going to have two related talks about sketching and graphic recording and storyboards and all these wonderful devices for visual representation. And it turns out the two of them snuck around behind my back and put together a unified presentation. <laughs> so that's what you're stuck with tonight. Sorry. <laughs> I know. If you have to leave, that's OK. So um, I'm really excited to have two people with different backgrounds and different orientations to this question come and share their insights with us from all the different perspectives. Without further ado. Thank you. I have the, um, uh, since I'm going to be roaming, I have the lavalier. Oh, I have one too. You have one too. Oh. There you go. And Deb and I really were introduced to each other by our very good friend Kate Rudder, who's also who ran the Sketchnote meetup in San Francisco, worked on Adaptive Path and Luxor and many other places, and she's in the field of visual practice, and so we've been meeting up and um, sharing tips and tricks and um, referring jobs to each other. And <laughs> yes, exactly. So, so I highly recommend it. Very cool. And I'm so thrilled to be here with you. Same, likewise. So. Would you like to start? Sure. So I think we wanted, we've come into the UX field from different backgrounds, and we found that um, we had a theme around whether it was required by our job or not we have a theme in common, which is that we needed to visualize things, and we needed to help other people visualize things um, through drawing and sketching of different levels of fidelity for different reasons, um, so that everybody could have a shared understanding and that we could move more rapidly. And so it's almost, it's a type of prototyping. We're prototyping with humans and ideas. And so we would, we found uh, communities of practice and we got better and we are always getting better. And so what, one of the things we have in common about this topic and what brings us here to you tonight, thanks for coming and for your interest, is that we believe that everyone innately has this ability. Uh, you, we all drew when we were kids. We, uh, we left that by the wayside perhaps for a variety of reasons, um, but that we wanted to have you be inspired this evening to pick it back up again and to uh, change the conversation in your practice, whether it's UX or whatever role you might have, um, by grabbing a pen and, and, and having a dialogue with marks as well as, as, as words. Okay. I'm Deb Aoki. And I'm Jay Broadbent. And we are going to get started. All right. All right. That's us. Um, you want to tell a little bit sure, about we'll talk a little bit about. I'm currently independent. Um, I spent 25 years on the East Coast and and uh, happily moved to California to join a nascent little software startup called GE Software, <laughs> and uh, um, joined the leadership team and spent two and a half amazing years there, and found that my entrepreneurial spirit was um, kind of needing to come back out again, and so I left and I have gone independent again. And so I'm in a formative phase. Uh, so I was a former senior UX director for the industrial internet. And um, now I'm doing design consulting with visual, visual practice at its core. And you? Let's see. Well, we were just talking about when my first technology job was. My first technology job was in 1996 when I worked for an internet service provider. I could still make the 56K modem noise. <laughs> me, me, <arr>. Anyway. <laughs> but um, basically my background is in uh, art. I have an art degree um, and I've been cartooning almost all my life. As you see in the bottom line, I'm a big fat manga nerd. So my side job when I'm not working in technology is I write about Japanese comics for uh, Publishers Weekly and Anime News Network. Um, but you, for the most part, for most of my career, um, those two separate parts of my life were, cons were quite separate, my drawing side and my content strategy technology side. It was maybe about, mm, I guess about eight or 10 years ago that they came together. And since then, I can't wait to tell everyone to, to do the same because it changed my life. It changed my work and we will explain. Totally. So what I do nowadays is I do storyboards uh, for new products. So this is for, uh, 
I worked at Citrix for Citrix Labs. So I do storyboards that explain concepts for new, um, new ideas for new products. I do graphic recording at business meetings, which will explain what that term means. Um, I work at, um, I do uh, workshops and brainstorming sessions where I do live drawing. And I also teach sketching workshops. Um, I'm gonna be, I'm, next week I'm starting a 10 week class. I'm co-teaching with James Young from Tangible UX. We are teaching a uh, co-teaching a class on design thinking and using simple sketching for UX. Very cool. And I do a lot of those things as well, and I'm in a phase of understanding really where, what's my whole landscape? When people, when I tell people I'm a designer and they say, well, what do you design? I have a hard time answering them because I've done a lot of different kinds of things. So this is my current, my current state of looking at the Venn of MJ, um, starting with graphic design, which I studied in school and always doing kind of wayfinding and visual sense making. Um, I, I entered the digital space by coming into information architecture and figuring out the nonlinear information experience um, as how it meets human behavior and cognition and so forth and looking at systems. So, and then I, you know, that, that the, as the field got more mature, came into user experience design and the rise of service design and digital products. And that's really been where I've been for the past 10 or 15 years. So as I come out of that and look at what I have to offer, I'm right there in the middle space. And again, with that whole, you know, the, the, the enveloping theme is I can't, I have a hard time talking without drawing. I would walk around the halls of, of any, any job or gig that I had with a stack of paper and I'd be scribbling on having, having uh, drawing conversations with people. So something that I'm, oh, that's pretty washed out, but something I'm particularly proud of having done recently was to work with a good friend of mine who's a design director at Google, gave a, a TEDx talk, and she wanted a sketch note of her talk so that she could, we were actually gonna use illustrations instead of traditional slides as she gave the talk, and she decided that it would be more impactful for her to show this amalgam, this is a, a sketch note, a planned sketch note of her con talk content at the, at the conclusion of her talk. So if you'll advance once more, we can see her on stage with the talk. And uh, this was, this was not, not something you would think of. And so it had a really amazing impact. And it was wonderful to work with her to visualize the story. And it really, um, we, she had a great experience of it. And I think the attendees had an amazing experience of it too. So this is something that l happened last November. And it led into my taking more seriously, once again, my capabilities and stretching my capabilities, so. First of all, we are gonna use a couple of terms that we thought we might explain instead of just throwing them at you willy-nilly. What's the difference between sketch notes, graphic recording, and graphic facilitation? A lot of people use these terms interchangeably, but they're actually quite different. What are sketch notes? And I'll talk about that because that's something that I've been doing and teaching for, I don't know, all close to a decade now. Um, I, don't even, I don't know exactly where it started, but as, you, as this illustration rightly shows, we have um, live capture of content that's occurring. Uh, someone might be sketching right now, for example, taking down some notes. It's a visual or a more visual version of what you might have done in the classroom when you were in high school or college where you're gonna capture what's meaningful to you at a personal scale, at your desk or at your, at your chair, in the audience. Um, and it, there are different uses for that. It can be for you, so that you have a better visual, mem or a better memory uh, of what the content is. And it could be something that you would be capturing to share with somebody else, to say, hey, I heard something really interesting. Um, so here's an example. I happen to have sketch noted a number of UX related conferences. It's just one of the ways that I'm starting to be known um, as somebody with the visual practice. The folks, the good folks who put on the Canucks conference in Ottawa invited me to come up and do the whole, all of the sessions. So I decided I did, I don't know how many, many there were, uh, did them quickly. And this is all real time, so simple color palette. Just catching, I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not capturing everything anybody's saying, but I'm capturing what I think, what I hear are the, the big chunks uh, or the, the, the key points and trying to illustrate them as much as possible. Sometimes I'm making a really simple version of what people are showing on their slides. 
And one of the nice ways that this has been used is then for people who are at the conference to take them back to their workplace. And there's a visual example of what, what that whole conference array uh, looks like. It would give people an idea about maybe which videos they wanted to look at later. Another ex couple of examples are here. Um, Lou Rosenfeld puts on the Enterprise UX conference, Lou and, and partners, Enterprise UX, and then uh, starting last November, uh, another conference called Design Ops. So if we know about DevOps for digital products, there's Design Ops, and uh, that's, these are all things that um, the, the little, if you see the elephant, that's their logo. And um, I'll be usually sitting in the back, sometimes in the front, for the duration of the plenary sessions, capturing this content, and then it's made available on their website in such a way that it's pushed out into, into um, social media so people can, can see it and there's some buzz. You might, again, see something and say, oh, that looks interesting. There's some, some keywords might pop out at you and say, let me follow up on that. So it's a way of peeking into the content for people who are not there, a way of remembering, remembering the content for people who were there. And just that last quick quick thing that oh, please. that's okay. no no John John Meda was the closing keynote at one of the Enterprise UX conferences, and he passed by me in the back row and he said, "Those aren't sketch notes; those are stealth notes because you're back <laughs> there, you're back in the back row, you know, like making these crafting these little uh, drawings that nobody's going to see until you publish them out." So I thought that I kind of liked that. If you've ever tried to capture um, this type of information in real time, you know how very difficult it is to do what MJ's doing. And to be honest, she's, she's not only distilling the information, she's using different font sizes and different colors to highlight different ideas. Um, she's using pictures, um, different ways of using line and color. So you look at this and this is really engaging. This is really memorable. Um, if you do sketch notes for yourself, I find, I, and I find that I like doing sketch notes whenever I go to a conference, it forces me to be a more active listener. Yes. And it helps me to really absorb what I heard and learned. And it's become something pleasurable to look back on later. So I encourage you that if you go to any talk, um, even if you go to a really boring meeting, try sketchnoting it. Because you'll find that you'll, you'll, be, you'll have quelled that monkey mind urge to check your phone. <laughs> so we'll get into a little, some, tips, <laughs> some tips and tricks about um, how, to, how to maybe an entry point to this um, a little bit later in the deck. Thank you. Anyway, this is black belt stuff, so yeah. Oh, Thumbs thank up. you. <laughs> so what is graphic recording? Well, graphic recording is a little, is, um, I mean, the biggest difference is it's big. It's not just a little notebook. You're using a big sheet of paper inside or the back of the room, and you are capturing live what the speaker is saying. Uh, the way I describe this is basically it's all reception and filtering. So you're not, you're not um, engaging with the speaker. You're taking what they say putting it out there, but, in, but the difference is that you're making it large so everyone in the audience can see it as it's happening. So this, for example, is some graphic recording I did at a, a PayPal um, technology summit. Um, and? And then I, this was, I think, one of the very first ones I did, so I'm going to take that little thing that I know how to do, and I'm going to do it really big on display, like Deb said, and it's super intimidating for me <laughs> <laughs> to do it for, this is IXDA and the Education Summit didn't have budget to video, so this was a way to take our content and bring it back to the people attending the main conference. This is really fun to do, because, uh, I mean, of course, you know, the main focus is the speaker, but a lot of times, like, a lot of people find that the graphic recording is so mesmerizing, it's really fun to see a conversation take shape in big form. What is graphic facilitation? Graphic facilitation is when the person with the visual skills is part of the planning going into an event, and it is often used for um, an, uh, something where there's, there's more participation. Uh, and I'm beating a strategy session, uh, a workshop, something where it's uh, a little different from a presenter and an audience, and then a, a, a capture of the pre-planned content. You're probably going to describe it a little better. <laughs> they're, they're, the people who, who are graphic or who are visual practitioners, there is not agreement, just as there's not agreement in many of the parts of the UX world about what terms mean and um, what roles are called. 
many people who do graphic recording and are really very, very skilled at making amazing, we call them charts, those big uh, papers and, and boards where they're uh, capturing a lot of content that could be, as I said, like the streaming presentation type or the conversation type or they, they will call themselves graphic facilitators because they're facilitating graphically the content. What we mean to make the distinction about is the graphic facilitation is some is a stakeholder in an event that is part of the team invested in how, what the structure is for people to use in the meeting and what the outcomes will be. Right. So because it's very difficult to try to structure a conversation and draw and take in, converse, take in inputs, a lot of times the graphic facilitators will have a preset template um, that, to guide the conversation. This is one from a company called The Grove. They're based in the Presidio. Um, and this is what it looks like when it's filled out. So again, this is, you know, it's, it's an interesting way to um, use this visual metaphor to guide people towards an outcome. Super powerful. Now, th this is something, the term that not most people don't use, but I, I use it just because I, I think it makes sense. It's visual conversations. It's not quite visual facilitation. It's not quite graphic recording. It's basically drawing to share understanding. Now, everyone's been to meetings that suck. I've been to many of them. <laughs> you know, you, get, you spend all this time finding room on the calendar and getting all the right people in the room, and what happens? Someone's checking their email, someone's playing on Twitter, someone's the, one guy's talking about me, 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 and then somebody's thinking about lunch. What, what's, what kind of lunch are they gonna give us today? Better be good. I find that, you know, and then it's, you know, then it's death by PowerPoint. It really did much get done. I find that when I, use, when I pick up a pen and have a visual conversation, people are more engaged. You know, that people, like, you're drawing live and you're asking for, is that what you mean? Um, and you're writing down what people say and people, oh, she acknowledged what I said. Yeah. Or my, my idea was heard. And so it, and then even just the, the act of drawing something scribbly and fun, just loosens up the mood, makes people feel, wow, this is kind of different and fun. And people are more creative and more engaged and want to participate more. I find that um, having a visual conversation changes the mood in the room, and changes the results. Absolutely. And uh, the, then when you get people engaged, they will often, they'll, they'll find there's a moment when they're trying to articulate something to, to convey to you that is at the board or, or drawing on a piece of paper or flip chart, and then They'll, there'll be that moment where you just hand the pen to them and they go and, you get, and then you get other people involved in it. This is not about a level of expertise. This is just about uh, uh, making sense, having, having the people who are in the conversation understand what people mean. And if you've ever played Pictionary, you don't, the, almost the more basic you are, the better you are and the more you're gonna win. So that's, it's that kind of idea. So it's not about making beautiful pictures. In fact, sometimes I think it's even better to do sloppy messy pictures because it invites participation yeah. you know if someone if i draw something and it's really quick and messy and then they go oh it's not like that white 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 oh how is it then because then I, what then people don't feel like it, what i've drawn is precious and can't be argued with that this is a participatory conversation i, I enjoy doing it because yeah. you know i mean i tell people that i have an art degree and I, I've had gallery shows, and I know, I know how to draw, create art that is my personal expression of my deepest feelings. But this is not that. No. <laughs> this is just me trying to communicate. Um, and be, because I work a lot of times with people who are from different cultures, um, English is maybe not their first language, or even they speak a different version of English than I do. They speak MBA English. They speak tech English. Somehow pictures just cuts through all the bullshit and just, <laughs> just kind of like, okay, what's real? What do you really mean? What does it mean underneath all the, all the jargon? So some examples. So this is like, uh, for example, um, trying to understand the purchasing, um, the invoice and uh, purchase order process um, when I was working at Ariba. And, and here's an example of a, this is actually a visualization of a, a product feature spec. 
So it's like you can read about it and you can know what the, the user is going to do and what you're going to enable, but it, being able to see it, like here's, here's what we've got and this is what we're aiming for, the whole like, light year is different. I mean, we, most of us have seen these types of con this type of information presented with just words. See how much easier this is to understand and digest and really take in? Um, if, you ever, if you ever follow Robert Reich, the economist, do check out his YouTube channel because he does some fabulous visual conversations. Normally I show the video of him explaining income inequality, but I don't have time today. You can go pick up his book. <laughs> He has a wonderful videos where he just does live drawing. He explains a complex economic principles with really fun and interesting drawings. There's also the book here. It's published by Fantagraphics, which publishes comics like Love and Rockets and um, Zap comics and stuff like that. Um, he, it's all his drawings of his lectures, so do pick it up. Um, like I said, we're, we're going to show you some really polished looking examples, but a lot of times what I do starts out super messy. All I'm doing is you know, trying to draw at the speed of the conversation and keep up with people and capture. And for those of you who think that that does not look messy. It's super messy. <laughs> I want of two things. I want to say, first of all, Deb, with her manga background, and uh, is I admire greatly her ability to very gesturally and quickly draw recognizable, nuanced humans, as you will see through, through examples of her work. And she has amazing writing. People compliment me on my writing. These are skills that you acquire this, the way that you, we'll get to that too, the way you did when you were in school. You, you slow down to go fast, and everyone can block print. And you say, oh, my handwriting is terrible. It's, it is achievable, and it's not a huge, huge thing. You can do it. So, all right, that's Deb's version of fast. <laughs> it's embarrassing. <laughs> and, oh, that's second, but thank you for saying that, because the second thing is, I have met no one who has ever said, this is perfect. <laughs> this, I love this work that I did. People are generally like, oh wow, you, you like that? That's, you, that's meaningful to you? Thanks. And you're meanwhile, they're like, uh, this is like, you know, it's the backstory. The backstory is going on in here. What's missing? What didn't work? What you don't know? Uh, what, I, what I tell myself? And I go through that. And that's one of the, one of the wonderful reasons why we do our birds of a feather is like, ah, oh, I think this sucks. And then the other people are like, would you look at that? <laughs> look at how you used the color there. That's amazing. And you go, oh, OK, <laughs> see that. I think you know, pe people are really, whenever I meet people, and when I teach the drawing class that I teach, I get a lot of people who say, I can't even draw a straight line. I don't know how to draw. <laughs> and which I usually say, well, you can draw, but um, let's, we'll get into that. So anyway, why is visual, why draw? Well, as you know, as researchers, most of us are visual learners. A lot of our brain power is spent processing visual information. Vi visuals are a universal language. That has not stopped me from not you know, putting together a Billy bookcase correctly the first time, but be that as that may. So visuals and storytelling are a really powerful way to communicate and teach. Um, this for, on the uh, left side is the Google Chrome comic done by Scott McCloud. He did um, a book called Understanding Comics and uh, Making Comics. He was commissioned by Google to create a comic when the Google Chrome browser first came out. So it explains the technology in a really fun and engaging way. He also, if you ever, you can Google it and find it and, as a PDF. He also drew all the engineers as characters in this comic. It's pretty neat. He's also currently working at Google on another project that she could not name when I last spoke with him. <laughs> The other one on the, on the right here is by a guy named Dan Rome. You might know him. He does a, a book called Back of the Napkin, which is about how to use simple sketching for business communication. He, if you um, look on SlideShare or you Google something called Healthcare Napkins, um, Dan Rome explained the ACA, Affordable Healthcare Act, in fabulous but simple drawings. So whereas the ACA is, a, as if you print it on 8.5 by 11 papers, it's about this high. He did it in about 30 or 40 slides. And where he made you, the patient, the doctor in red, the insurance in blue. And then he re basically explained that the healthcare reform act is not really healthcare reform, but actually insurance reform. And vectors and the insurance hate each other. And in the middle is you who is getting squeezed. Check it out. It's a really fun little thing. 
But again, you know, it's not super fancy, but it does the job. Um, Dan Rome uses this example in his book, uh, Explain the Doodle That Founded Southwest Airlines. This is a napkin sketch uh, that was done in an airport bar by the founders of Southwest Airlines where they figured, hey, you know, why don't we start an airline that just goes between these three Texas cities? That's the business plan. Fly between these cities several times a day, every day. Even messy doodles can generate business and agreement and collaboration. This is a, um, one, uh, Mark Benioff created this for, um, I guess, who's the woman? She's now in charge of the Apple stores. But um, trying to explain how Salesforce could help Burberry have a social media platform and use it to um, uh, create social media buzz and then how to like, use, SAP, how use SAP and Facebook all together. He apparently practiced several times how to draw this super messy drawing before the meeting. He got the job, by the way. He, he, made, he closed the deal. Again, super messy. You see there's a person in the middle? <laughs> Thick figure, nice. <laughs> there you go. Again, doesn't have to be fancy, but, it has, but drawing helped him communicate and seal the deal. So why draw? Why draw pictures? Um, I find that when I draw pictures, instead of just writing things out, it tells a story that focuses on human needs, not on just what the technology can do or what the business can do or, the, or limitations thereof. Um, when I draw and I'm, as people are talking and I'm recording and drawing what they're saying, people feel hurt. Oh, what I said was acknowledged. I can calm down now and I can listen to other people. <laughs> Visuals are also memorable. You will remember a picture longer than you will remember a paragraph. Also, sometimes it's really helpful to see the big picture, so to speak, of how everything works together. Mm -hmm. And drawings are just more fun. I mean, come on. How many, if, we all know the term death by PowerPoint. We've all seen slides that really are like a 10-point type. You're like, dude, what? Have some mercy on us over 50s. We're here. <laughs> also, kind of, it, drawing encourages just the act of drawing encourages others to be creative and open. It brings a spirit of playfulness to the room. Uh, this is a uh, same meeting. I mean, we've all been to brainstorming sessions where we just use post-it note, post-it note, post-it note, sharpie, sharpie, sharpie. This is the same meeting, same content, presented differently. You notice I cheated. I used the big post-it notes. <laughs> But you see how the difference is the same content, just with type and pictures. It's so much easier to skim. You can hone in on what are the emotional moments, um, what's important, and what's, you know, it just gives you a hierarchy to look at. So this could be achieved by having a practitioner on your team who is listening and capturing and generating what's on the right. And it can also be achieved as a second phase or as an outcome of the, the, the generated content from the left. So there's, there's a lot of different ways that can play. A lot of times when I've seen um, presenting um, user stories, a lot of times I'll see screenshot, 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 which basically has the emotional content of, well, I don't know, piece of, piece of fish cake. Whereas when you show like, you show like the person actually having frustrations or confusion with the screenshot, you know, the viewer can hone in on, oh, you know, what's the, what's the key moment here? Where's the pain point? It also makes you feel like, oh, my God, we have to fix that. That sucks. The, the sound is cut out. Is it really? Uh-oh. Oh, wait. I'll check. Check, check, check. Hello? Check. Yep. Maybe I need to go up a little higher. No, I think you're on. Okay, I'm on again. No, I think it was just uh, a blow. Oh. Ha-ha. Maybe I have to talk like this. No. <laughs> Don't do it. So I've worked sometimes with uh, startups where they, um, they have to t tell the story to get funding. This one particular startup, this was his story, his problem statement slide. This is after. <laughs> same problem, same issues, but instead I t helped him tell the story from a human context. Later on he told me, he said, my meetings are going so much better now. I'm getting more money. Absolutely. <laughs> So yeah, I earned my keep on that little job. Emotions, context, um, 
the, the internal narrative, the, the st steps and the fa phases, activities. So much more relatable. Yes. Um, this is another project I worked at at Citrix um, with the Zen Mobile team. We, uh, the research team went to follow, uh, shadow the San Diego Sheriff's Department to um, document like, what their challenges were using, was using our mobile product. Um, one of the stories that I drew was this, um, this police officer, he has to, he's gonna help out his partner. He's got his foot on the gas, he's got his hand on the steering wheel, he uses his phone, he's gonna use the secure map app to find out where his partner is. And Zen Mobile says, I need, a upper, I need a secure password of 10 uppercase, lowercase numbers and letters. And he's got one hand on the steering wheel, one foot on the gas, he goes, oh, fuck this. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Bleep. <laughs> But anyway, it's like what I found was really fun about doing this set of stories was um, one was, I mean, other than the fact that when we showed it to the sheriff's department, they go, wow, you heard us. You really get what happened. You really get what it feels like to be us. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, I found that was really valuable about this, even long after this project was done, was I felt like the designers and the uh, developers for, forevermore remembered there were users who aren't like them, who don't sit on their tuckus all day in front of a computer with a lovely la with a lovely keyboard, entering ten uppercase and lowercase numbers and letters. Totally. So I feel like that kind of empathy is worth a lot. And showing it particularly in this way, I have seen and, and I'm engaged in some work right now that is about visualizing research in ways that are more evocative, because people are just we. For all the reasons we've said already, people need to be given the opportunity to experience this from their own humanity, and they're not doing it even with uh, condensed and chunked information. That's all words. So it's very compelling. Um, when I was at Citrix, we also used to do customer interviews um, for, at our executive briefing center for prospective customers. This was for a Japanese company called Recruit. They do HR publishing and HR services. They're kind of like Monster. A little. Um, and basically what it did, what it did was we, uh, I did an interview with um, one of the employees and he explained that how things are different in uh, their company. That their employees are 40% male, 60% female, but traditionally most of the female workers leave after they have children. And that Japanese government is only now starting to make it easier to work from home, which is really important for Citrus because we, did a, we do a lot of um, a desktop virtualization that makes it easier for you to log in securely anywhere. What was interesting about this is that um, this, they also told me a story about how a lot of business travelers in Japan don't fly, they catch a train. And Japan is quite mountainous, and every time it goes through a mountain, they lose connectivity. So when we did, told this story, our salesperson looked at it and goes, oh, we actually have something that remedies that. So he changed his deck to highlight and solve, and highlight the Citrix products that actually solves this problem. Um, before, uh, when we had executive briefing center um, interviews, um, a lot of times our staff would take notes, do a Word doc, send out this document and say, look, we listened to you. Mm -hmm. When we started doing this, on the other hand, this was like a 40% read and response rate, 100% read and response rate. Got some really lovely quotes too. Nice. <laughs> handed this to the C, uh, CTO at the, in, at the briefing, and he was so touched. He, the, the Japanese sales rep got, dude, if you, we get this account, I'm gonna give you a commission. <laughs> Unfortunately, we got outbid. But anyway, be that as that may. <laughs> Your work was still a success. This was still fun. <laughs> That's awesome. Similarly, at GE, we had a, uh, cust the customer conference and five pages of accomplishments and here's what we did all year and this is wahoo hoo. Uh, nobody's gonna read that. And, and employees are all busy working away, toiling, toiling away. So uh, a, a, a consolidation with text and imagery and you know, way of, of saying, oh my gosh, all right, in one view, this was shown and printed out and made posters of and put into the environment in a way that people said, oh, I, I, I can feel some pride in what we've accomplished here. Uh, it was a big hit. Steve, who's in the audience, also worked with me at Citrix. We, um, we started doing these customer interviews, um, sketch notes customer interviews for several clients. And we would, um, those 
sketched out interviews would be printed out large and posted up in the offices. People would stop and look. And it'd be this kind of neat way to tell the story of who our customers are, what their pain points are. It basically got a lot of traction. It got sent to all levels of the company. Um, I once did a story, a sketch note about a, a big client we had who was very, very unhappy with us. And they were very unhappy because the, they felt like they weren't being listened to. So I did like a six page sketch note of their, all their pain points. I almost immediately started getting calls from execs saying, what is this, what is this 50 things that we don't have in our system that, that is a showstopper for them? I don't know, maybe you should call them. <laughs> That's kind of fabulous because it was just the pictures, that, that moment of empathy, showing humans being frustrated, having problems, creates this impulse of like, oh my God, I didn't know it was that bad. Yeah, I've broken the rule, Jeb, here in this one. There's no, there are no humanoids in there. And that's something that I, what we both advocate for, is to bring the human, emo the human figure and the human emotion into it, so. Okay, so everyone says, I can't draw. Ha ha, <laughs> I disagree. If you're writing, you're right. already drawing. You learned how to make a line and a circle and to make it into a letter and you learn how these combinations create words and these combinations create sentences and create meaning. You don't even think about it anymore. Once upon a time it was, you know, it would be kind of painful to, to write letters. But now you don't even think twice. Once upon a time my, my signature could be read as Deborah Aoki and now <laughs> it looks like a squiggly. <laughs> yeah, so the, basically that's how I feel about drawing to this point where I, I have this, it's another alphabet. If you're a Chinese or Japanese, you know that a lot of, pic, uh, a lot of the uh, kanji have pictorial origins. For example, this is the kanji for I. This is the one for bird. I don't know how they got from that to that, but uh, that's Japanese. <laughs> uh, they also have compounds. This is the kanji for person and tree. Put it together, the kanji for rest. So the, I basically what I'm trying to, what I do when I teach drawing is I'm trying to teach you a, a visual vocabulary of things you can mix and match to, to tell all kinds of concepts. So why do two dots in a face, two dots in a line read as a face? Why is that good enough to represent a person? There's a word for it. I don't know how to pronounce it, but there's a word for it. <laughs> So anyway, graphics, simplified graphic storytelling is nothing new. It's, it's been around forever. So it's not, again, not about making art. It's about communicating. If you can draw this stuff, you can draw stuff. <laughs> you can draw lots of stuff. So here's what we're not going to do. You're gonna, if you get another paper, piece of paper, <laughs> we're going to show you how to draw. <laughs> See? <laughs> I could censor myself. I love that one. <laughs> okay, do you have a piece of paper and a pen? Let's give it a little shot. There's space up here if anybody else wants to, <laughs> if anybody wants to come up and, and uh, have a hand at practicing up here. Stakes are low. We're a supportive <laughs> group. This is Kai. <laughs> Got whiteboard markers. <laughs> All right. So, first thing is draw a bunch of circles. There are three things that will, that will change the motion of a face. One is the eyes, one is the mouth, and one is the eyebrows. So if you draw two dots, eyes, and you just change the mouth, you've changed the emotion. Sometimes even, like this, this unhappy, if you put it to the side, it's a different emotion. My favorite, the meh face. Oh, right, that's a good one. Impress me, human. <laughs> <laughs> and then, of course, there's different degrees that you can change it by just by changing the size of the mouth. Like, oh, what's that? Ah, what's that? <laughs> Same eyes, different mouth. Now, you could draw the same face and just change the eyebrows, and you get a whole bunch of different emotions as well. 
Notice that if you point the eyebrows down, it's angry. Point them the opposite way, they're kind of upset. One down, one up is kind of like, huh? <laughs> and you can do different things with eyes. Uh, for example, if you do like two commas, it's like rolling your eyes. Two carrots is like, oh. Interestingly, if you do it down, it looks like they're sleeping. If you do it up, they look like they're happy. I don't know why. <laughs> uh, sometimes if you want to show somebody oh, yeah. looking to the side, or like, oh, hungover. <laughs> right. Commas is a good approach. And then I like do uh, circles inside of circles, solid, and, and make the eyeballs move around a little bit. Well, now we actually with the uh, with the increase in use of emoji, mm -hmm. it's it's easier to uh, to mm -hmm. see and recognize and, and generate this kind of thing. Sometimes you can just do put faces like if you just you're draw, you're right even if you're just writing like this step of the user user experience, someone is happy, someone is quizzical. You can just draw a face, and immediately you've added some personality to your findings or your, right. what you're saying. Um, sometimes I'll add extra lines for other effects. So, for example, drawing that <laughs> where it's like shows pissed, they're pissed off, or the little lightning bolts is like, Ugh! or the squirrelies is like, whoa, dude, dizzy. Also, sometimes um, I'll do things like. Um, Put like these little dit dits, I call them. Show, oh, I'm noticing something on this side. Oh, right. Yeah, attention. You can draw, you can draw a whole spectrum of emotion just by changing the eyes, mouth, eyebrows. Goes a long way. So you can show like, a, like for example, in the, in the process, in the, was the, your customer is using the experience like, oh, hmm. What is this? White screen. <laughs> you can also put faces on stuff. This is my favorite. This is the, the chronic equivalent of the blue screen. <laughs> Come on, we, we're humans. We like to anthropomorphize everything. This is also the iPhone and the Android phone not getting along. I made a big mistake once when I taught this class at Google and I drew an iPhone. Big mistake. <laughs> you also will, um, just by changing the placement of the dots, you can show how, what direction mm -hmm. someone is looking. Mm -hmm. By changing the placement and the size of the eyes, you can change the age. You can add no, different uh, personalities by changing the eyes and noses. Another aspect not shown is the, um, how circular or ovoid the head is. Mm. Um, if you, especially if you attach it to a, a, a physical, a representation of a physical body, if it's the more round it is, the more younger it seems, mm -hmm. and the, the more, more oval, the more adult, and then where the, the placement of the eyes are mm -hmm. on the circle, because our eyes are actually lower than we think they are when we draw this, this way. There's a weird little factoid I learned a little while ago, is that your eyeballs itself do not change size from the time you were born to the time you die, but the, the size of your face changes. So that's why we're naturally predisposed to think big eyes and wow. the word face is like a baby. Okay, so people draw stick people. I think they look, stick people look malnourished. <laughs> Instead, I like to draw it like this. There's a, lot of op there's a lot of benefits to drawing people like this. Um, for one thing, you can do a lot of things within the body of the square. So for example, you can get clothes, you can do, um, uh, when I draw like um, women, I'll draw like the, um, the, dr uh, the body as a triangle mm -hmm. to look like a dress. By the way, I have a, a little cheat sheet that I'll, I'll be handing out at the end here that has a lot of this stuff on it. 
Um, if you need to draw a crowd, um, do you know how to do this one? Oh, I use the, uh, it's like if you can draw mountains, you can just draw <laughs> a bunch of humps, um, and then you put them behind each other. I use this all the time. That's, they're almost like, uh, you can do them like fence like this, so they're in a row, or you can do them so they're staggered, you know, and add heads. And it's a quick way to draw a crowd. Super fast. So it also helps to give them, yeah, you give them some kind of grounding. They're at the table, they're on a, they're on a curve, or that, what's happening down there at the bottom. Give Sometimes, them like, if you show different go. teams, you can say team A, right, and then draw a circle around it. Team A and team B are suddenly getting along. <laughs> there are other ways to draw people. Um, there are star people. Uh, the advantage to star people is it's basically a circle and one stroke. You can also draw what I call Fisher Price little people. Head, body. It's a person. Like this, right? <laughs> Just enough information. <laughs> But you can also do um, the size and the, the, the type of word balloon can convey um, whether something is said, thought, or yelled. Mm -hmm. You don't even, or this little squiggly was like I'm nauseous, or like dotted lines as I'm whispering. Um, sometimes if I'm drawing artificial intelligence, I'll draw it with a square and a little, little lightning bolt. Um, conversation, two overlapping ones. Um, sometimes you don't even have to put words in the word balloon. It's like, I have a question. I have an idea. I have a solution. I love it. No, thank you. <laughs> Whoa, pg and &E Bill. <laughs> Especially this month, damn it. And you can also draw simple symbols. Um, usually what I'll tell people is that you don't have to draw everything in the world. Because if you're in a certain company or a certain industry, you're just going to draw the same, sorry, the same stuff. You know, I caught myself <laughs> over and over again. Same concepts, time, security, um, cloud, email, money. Just learning these little simple symbols will help, will get you, take you pretty far. Um, lines and the types of lines can convey all kinds of things. So for example, a wavy line can in, in indicate heat or steam or it can indicate stinky. Um, these like little, lines with the little lightning bolt, like anger, like I'm yelling, or I'm crying, or this is noisy, mm. or electricity. Um, fast flying, slow flying. Mm -hmm. See how just these, making these choices of lines convey different speed and energy and sound. Um, sometimes just like lines can convey something is new and noteworthy. Or like our pal, the Wi-Fi signal. It's a bunch of commas. <laughs> Drawing books and documents and emails. A lot of times I'll draw um, user interactions. Um, for example, when you draw a person using a phone, it's awfully hard to put your, put your screenshot in that teeny tiny little phone. So I draw the screen in the back. Same if your person's looking at a laptop, draw the screen in the back. And it makes, I like that you do it in a, in a contrasting color so that you, it's clear what's happening there, that, that what you're looking at on that little screen, that laptop, is what represented behind, and, um, and then it's not competing. And if, it's, if it was all the same value, it would still be nice, but it wouldn't be as easy to read. And a lot of times, too, uh, um, drawing perspective can be tricky. So sometimes I'll just use side views. Kind of like, you know, like an Egyptian kind of drawing. <laughs> it's a lot easier. <laughs> Um, computers and phones. Um, I've lately been doing some storyboards for AR and VR. So what I'll do is like this is uh, AR. Show it, and so what I'll show is like this is what they're seeing in the glasses, and then the black is what the hand, what their hand is seeing, and then what they're seeing is in different color. Or VR, like what this. So this square box leading to the glasses mm. indicates that that's what the person is seeing. So you can, like, you can take these simple symbols, kind of like how that um, kanji for person and tree equals rest. You can take a symbol for house, 
and turn it into a lot of related concepts. For example, a house can turn into work from home, or house head is a, I'm a homeowner, or you know, this is our headquarters, and you put a lock on it, this is our private cloud, for example. All these kinds of combinations can be done. Uh, money is also another one that I often have to draw. Notice, look, look at this beautifully simple scissors. That's, you can, you can do that. That's something that it would take a little bit of practice. It's not super complicated. You've got a couple spirals and an arc and a line. And so just, be, we'll, get, we'll get there. We'll talk about, like, how do you, how do you, you can look at that and say, okay, I see it. I can deconstruct it in my mind, but I don't have that. I don't think of it at the moment to, to channel it to my hand. And we'll talk about practice in a little bit. All right, sketch notes. So we talked about why and what the, how they're used and, the, and that sort of thing. And um, I absolutely, the, the, if I could give everybody the ability to go out there and just start doing this, like adopt this behavior, um, I would totally do that. That would be, if, if I rubbed a magic lamp and a genie came out and said, what's your one wish? I would say, make everybody draw stuff because, or have, enable everybody to know that they can draw stuff is a better way to put it. The way that you, can, uh, that you can walk out of here and begin this practice, if you're not already doing it, um, is to find a way to make it fun. One of my favorite ways is to look at ways that go back to when it was fun and do something that might look childish. This particular author, um, whose name I will mispronounce, uh, Torogomi. <laughs> oh, he does the everyone poops book. Torogomi <laughs> has pro is prolific in, in publishing children's materials, and a few years ago uh, created this book called Scribbles, which are, it's just this big newsprint style book that has prompts in it, like this one, um, with two people in a chasm, how are they going to get across? So you need to add something. So you don't have to face the blank page, you need to add something, and there were uh, page a day calendars that also had prompts on them. Um, these, are, these two have drawn, I've drawn on top of them that give them matching hats. They were just heads that ended about here and they were empty. And so I decided to be literal and give them matching hats <laughs> or draw this guy's hair. He's getting a haircut with a lawnmower. And you can embellish them. Now they're on Flickr, if, as long as Flickr still exists, there are collections of these where people have posted up what they've done and you can see a wide variety of Unfortunately, nobody's posting the unadorned version so that you can see what, what the original was before people add it onto them. But this is, this is the way to make it super fun. Another way, two other quick ways are to, if you, if you post, if you're still old school and you have a paper calendar in your house, like from the CR Club or whatever, that's on your fridge or it's in your kitchen, on, on occasion, just put some little mark about something that occurred day it rained, you put a, a, a drop and put a little blue mark on it like it, there was water. Or, I don't know, you had a, you, you just put a little something in there and if you live with other people, particularly children or um, somebody with whom you have um, a fun comic relationship, you can almost have a dialogue without, without words by what you put there. Um, you can do that with post-it notes, you can do that with, um, so, Find a way to create visual code um, in your communications with people, but make it be fun, you know, that kind of thing. Or draw your grocery list. Um, I don't think people do that anymore. They, they speak them into the, <laughs> the, <laughs> the home bots and then we're reminded <laughs> when we're at the store. So another, in terms of, so that's, that's the first step, is you've got to find a way to make that pleasurable and reinforcing. Um, the second way is there are a number of people out in the world uh, including us, who, who are perhaps more published and have more uh, structured materials. Mike Rohde has been um, a leader in, he's a uh, designer in Milwaukee, who founded the Sketchnote Army, which is a blog where he collects and posts uh, everybody, anybody who wants to. It's completely open from every level to, you know, how are they using it? Teachers and I mean, you name it, it's not just for UX. Um, 
there's the, something called World Sketchnote Day now that I just that just started I think in a recent year or two, um, and you can find sketchnotes on Twitter. I would urge you not if you're if you're starting out and you're interested in this. Um, if you Google sketchnotes, you're going to see the most dense array of really uh, of uh, what I uh, they're, they're, they look very artistic. You know, it's just it's it's a little overwhelming even for people who practice it. So I think looking at um, places where people are posting in contemporary work um, in the blog or, or maybe on Twitter is, are great places to just to see some variety because there's a wide spectrum of skill level, of, of subject area, of uses, and so forth. And, and more people are finding it every day. It's pretty cool. And then I think lastly, um, just try it. Try it. it was, as you said earlier, if you're in a meeting or you're listening to a TV show, uh, Mike Rohde himself will sketch note uh, uh, football games. He sketch notes um, his church services. He posts those as well. And he, sometimes they're just type, but he'll just sort of he'll be doing that listening activity for you know what what's important to me. What do I want to write down? What do I want to make big? What do I want to make small? Um, how do I start to think about arranging things? And those are those are good ways to get going. And you know, give yourself some credit for doing that. Um, the same way you would maybe ask somebody you trust to give you good feedback on some new habit that you're that you're adopting, or you know, just say, "Hey, I did this," um, and acknowledge yourself for that. People who do it love to see people getting going on it. They love to say, at a, at, "You know, go for it. Keep keep doing that." One way to think about it is that one, one thing that happens with when you first start sketch noting, like say sketch noting a TED talk, is you start to feel this tidal wave of words and stuff coming at you, and there's just no way you can catch up. And oh my God, I can't, I can't possibly doc document all this. The, the thing. Hmm. Oh, sorry, sorry. Ahem. <laughs> all right, so. The thing is, when you first start sketching, you know, like, uh, like you say there's a TED talk or something like that, or you're in a meeting, you're going to feel like this sense of overwhelming, overwhelming, like, oh my God, there's no way I'm going to capture all this information. It's just coming at me too fast. I'm not going to get it all. The way to think about it is, it's okay if you miss stuff. Just yeah. grab what you can. But just like you can't catch every fish in the ocean, you can just catch the ones you can. And if you learn, and then. After uh, some practice, you kind of learn to um, just how to listen in with um, more of a filter, how to listen carefully for the key moments, um, how to listen for the, the key points, and how to let the rest of it flow, flow away like the river. Then you just kind of relax. It's just it's the first couple times you do it, you do feel like there's just no way I can get it all. The way I t try to think about it is um, you could. Um, you don't need to capture it all. The video has already captured it all, you know? You're not obliged to catch every single piece of information that was conveyed. You're just trying to capture what catches your ear, what's interesting to you. And if some stuff, you know, flow away in, in the speed of how they're talking and stuff, it's OK. Totally. You're curating content, depending on how you're planning to use the sketch one, if it's for you. It's it's what you heard that you're able to capture, no problem. You can if you want it to be an, an archival record, you might have the opportunity to go back and, and make a second pass on it. And as you're practicing, that's also a viable option. This is sort of it's a test. There are some very there are a couple of really great TED talks that are actually about listening, and so listening to that and capturing those are really great. Um, one of the ways that I've heard people who do live capture talk about developing that listening practice is almost like um, multiple buckets of water. And so there's water flowing into this one. And as it starts to fill, it tips into this one. And so you, you get to, oftentimes I'll be listening to a speaker and I won't be writing yet. I'll be waiting to sort of weigh it out. How, what, what, do, what, do I, what am I hearing that I want to go for? And then I have developed, through some practice, the ability to begin writing those things that I'm hearing while I'm hearing what's coming next. And so that's, it's just this water flow kind of thing that happens. Um, I think the best advice I got about sketch yeah. notes is, one, 
the first five minutes, the guy's just telling a story. Yes. Don't worry about it. <laughs> the second tip was um, content first, pictures later. Get, capture the content, leave space for a drawing later. You don't have to try to draw and write at the same time. That's the biggest transition from people who are used to taking conventional notes, written notes, um, a la classroom style. You're, you're doing that linear thing where you're writing in lines from left to right or, or depending on your language. When you begin to capture uh, phrases or just keywords, scatter them around. I mean, you, you might want to go from maybe upper left to lower right or, or you could you could start with the name of the thing in the middle and kind of radiate outward, and, and we'll talk about layouts in a yeah. moment. But you give yourself a bunch of space, because not only will you be able to em, um, add embellishment or add iconography or other kinds of illustration, but you can also find ways to um, connect things or uh, separate things to create um, containers, dividers, um, or, or use color as a second wave to embellish and to enhance the content that you've captured. Yeah. So I skipped a little bit. Um, now, how do you use this in right. your UX practice? Yes. Um, journey maps, personas, these are other great ways to use a drawing. Um, this is a persona template I use. Um, I'll draw the person fairly large, but the name, who they are, and what are their needs, what are their worries, um, quotes. Um, this was from a conversation where we were trying to figure out who user personas at a, well, okay, I'll just say it. It was at Ariba. <laughs> and then this was a, just a live conversation. As everyone, um, this was a case where it was a visual conversation, kind of like visual facilitation. They had, who's this person? What? Oh, yeah, you know, like, give her a name. Catch it out, right. And so it got to this point where we created this whole series of personas and then no, people were no longer talking about the casual buyer. They think, I don't think Maggie would do that. <laughs> it was kind of neat. And for the, for the hardcore researchers, these are, these are provisional, provisional personas. Provisional personas. <laughs> yeah. To presence the, so yeah, this is wonderful. So this is like a really rough kind of layout I use. Um, you know, the quotes, the name, description, what's important, what drives them nuts. Sometimes the conversation, just having this picture of a person um, invites people to, to embellish and add to the story <laughs> what they know about that customer. It's kind of, it's a really fun conversation to have. Or? Or you're in meetings where you expect people to participate and uh, not everybody knows everybody. I mean, pretty much, unless you're in the same room with the same team all the time, you're gonna be with some folks who are visiting, we're gonna be with customers, you're gonna be with a mixed group. One of the ways to get people involved is to give them a simple, here's, here's your avatar, you get to, you know, show me how you feel right now, put your name real big. There's a little, there's some, you can't see them from back there, but there's some guidelines that let people not write their name really tiny and up there at the top. Uh, in this particular case, each of the participants in this meeting had a different color post-it note pad that was already set on their desk and you know, make your name tag. So tell me, pick that one post-it, we are cutting in and out, um, and what's your, what's your role? So that now we have, we can use these as both introduction and as a means for coding, it's a, it's a legend for people's um, uh, post-ups in, in the idea session. So I'll know that if a blue post-it's up there, it's Helena, Helena. Um, and how long have you been with the company? And maybe what are you thinking? So it's, it's you know, I've seen mood, mood uh, stickers or drawings for scrum meetings. How are we doing? How are people feeling today? You know, this is a version that would let you bring it into a meeting or a workshop. A lot of times we do things like uh, do journey maps. This is um, a live capture from a, a countertop company where we followed the journey of a granite countertop from the mountain in Turkey where the minerals were mined to when it gets installed into a, uh, when it gets installed into a kitchen. So this was just based off of live conversation with several different stakeholders, several different people in the company from all levels. And they described what happens and where the, and you start seeing where the pain points are you see a real end-to-end -end process. This was really interesting because um, as the executives came by to look at it, they didn't, you could really see where the, where the heat points were, 
where things started to get tangled, where th pain was really happening. What was, what was actually particularly fascinating about this project was there was a lot of pain happening in the, in the order fulfillment part, but what, we, what was fascinating was the team figured out that the problem wasn't fixing the order fulfillment part. The problem came, was further upstream. When the, when the salespeople or the, um, the kitchen and bath places didn't have an accurate assess, didn't have accurate information of what was actually in stock and when, where, the, where the countertops were and when they could be delivered and when, because they didn't have this accurate information, they had to, there were disappointed customers who they had to give discounts to or they had to order the, order the materials from, a, from a, another supplier and then eat the cost. So it was fascinating because by seeing that end-to-end -end experience, not just focusing on that, the team, the, the, the people of that company themselves figured out that they needed to solve the problems downstream they need to fix things far upstream. And that was really fun to see. We've both had the opportunity to work in circumstances where uh, uh, ideally a 360, uh, in terms of constituents that would have a, have a role in that chain, in that journey, would be, they'd be reporting on their view and they think they know, oh yeah, we know how this all goes down and how it all fits together. but but. It, Without exception, when, when you back up and you, everybody stands back and looks at that and, and process, they say, wow, I, I don't think I knew this. And I don't think that Joe over in purchasing knows this either. And can you imagine what impact this is going to have on our company when we put it in the hallway? Yeah. A, lot of the, a lot of the journey maps that I did for these projects, I can't show you. This is one I can. Yeah. <laughs> this is one that's what, that we were lacking out the story of what it's like to um, have a, take a business trip, be an experienced business traveler. And then you're doing the corporate travel, you get a cab, and then the kiosk, sometimes the kiosk is broken, and then there's long lines, and there's this guy yelling at you all the time. And then you go through security, and then you go try to figure out your gate, your gate, and the flight got canceled, and then you have to go corporate travel, and blah, 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 blah. Anyway, this was fun to drive. Yes, we've done some. <laughs> I have been there many times. <laughs> it's just, it's super, it's, it's, it's so rewarding, basically. It, the second way this can happen is we will, as we were talking about visualizing research earlier, we can visualize the research that we gain when we uh, are, uh, whether we're doing it or our teams are doing it or a third party is doing it, where we're trying to actually illustrate this is reality and we haven't heard it directly from the business stakeholders, but we need to kind of put it in their face. You know, this, this technique works as well in the same way we saw earlier uh, from research findings. So drawing it, putting it in the environment. Yeah, same thing. There's, I've done some things recently that I would love to show you, but I'm not, can't, can't show you. Yeah. But this was, <laughs> this was mapping out the traditional loan process and subsequent to this, we looked at what the lending tree loan process was. And um, so it's just showing the many, many steps and then by showing, putting this in contrast with what the other process, what the current process is that this group is looking to evaluate. Um, that contrast was really evident. Gave them some ideas about where to focus. There's other ways that you can present like a day in a life. You can do it uh, hour by hour from sunrise sun to nighttime. It can be like a, like a journey, like a shoots and ladder type journey. Or it can be in a row. There's all kinds of ways to show um, different steps in sequence. I'm a big fan of the swim lanes approach mm. um, because we have other players and other parts, other systems, other equipment, you know, things that come into play. But th these are great. Um, this is a journey map I did um, at Sony where I just used post-it notes to show the different steps. This was, um, we were trying to think of a journey map for a gesture controlled car. So the idea is the guy starts off in San Francisco, and these are all the different features that his, um, that his car can do. Like for example, um, the, the sensor can sense that it, um, it is a bottle of wine in his, uh, under next to his seat, not a person. Um, news music, he picks up his wife, gets a text message. And so this was, this was a collaboration between um, the engineering group, which was based in Brussels, and engineering group based in Japan and having the visuals help them really collaborate much more efficiently. There's other story layouts which I showed you earlier. Um, 
with, with sketch notes, like um, there's ways to make them better. <laughs> All kinds of techniques like making containers, arrows, bullet points. Yeah, but here's a great, there's this example of leaving, if you can leave space, mm -hmm. you're able to do more with it. And even if you have, um, I mean, people, people stress out about, well, I don't know where to put things. Um, if you, uh, if you leave space, let's just say this chunk was over here somewhere, you can still connect it. You, if, you, if you give yourself, um, they're almost like pillows. They're, they're fluffy white spaces of a pillow. <laughs> I'm kind of guilty of making sketch notes that look like downtown Hong Kong. <laughs> it's way, way too busy. Try to pack in way too much stuff. So I'm a big, if I can get in white space, I think I'm wrong today. Yeah. <laughs> um, other tips for having visual conversations? Um, much like, you know, doing user conversations, right? I mean, there's something really powerful about letting, about the moment of silence and letting people fill in. Um, and then what happens? <laughs> um, ask people if, like you're doing live drawing, there is no shame in telling someone to slow down or explain that acronym. Because some, you might be, you might feel initially, oh, I'm the only Dumbo who doesn't know what this acronym means. And a lot of other people are silently going, whew, thank God, she asked. Um, messy drawings are good. Like I said, messy drawings can invite, um, invite collaboration. Um, sometimes I'll use, um, when you have a, a whiteboard markers, you have your four colors. Um, you have your red, green, blue, and black. I'll save the red for, to illustrate pain points or highlight pain points. Or I'll save the green for like moments when uh, things are going well or things are costing money. Or you try to use a, a consistent color for your character throughout the story. For example, everyone from company A is blue all the time, or anything related to company A is blue all the time. And then remember that it's not, you're not drawing hieroglyphics. You're not just drawing pictures. Make sure to add captions, because that helps people who weren't in the room understand what you were trying to say. That is something I learned when you're developing your visual vocabulary. Um, it's, it's forbidden in Pictionary. So if you imagine the speediest way that you could possibly draw an ice cream cone that your, t your teammate guesses that, um, what we're advocating is you draw ice cream cone. Um, you don't have to label absolutely everything, but when you, so that somebody goes, wow, that's uh, a pyramid, upside down pyramid with a cloud on it, or I don't know. <laughs> like, so just, and also if you draw something that you're, you need to communicate to somebody else who's not there uh, and you're in doubt, when in doubt, label it. So, helps. All right. But if you want to learn more and you're excited by what we're showing you today. Besides talking further with us. <laughs> <laughs> here's, some here's some advice. Um, sometimes I'll challenge myself to um, listen for commonly used jargon in my, in my company. Uh, working in silos is always a fun one. Oh. Um, risk aversion. Um, I like to read a lot of comics. Um, I like to think my comics reading is tax deductible now. Um, and I sometimes, uh, if you have kids, draw with your kids. Um, if you, um, I, when I was at Citrus, we used to do lunchtime drawing sessions together. Um, the, meet, the sketch note meetup, I think, is dormant right now. But if you can find uh, meetups, that's a really great way to practice. Um, also, if you're stuck, like say you want to figure out a, how to draw synergy, Go to this website. It won't give you the perfect answer all the time, but it'll at least give you some place to start. It'll give you little, little pokes. It is open source, and um, if you generate uh, something that you that could be included, you can um, submit it. So sometimes it's really way off, but it's fun anyway. It's, it is really wonderful. There are I'll lots actually, of wonderful books. Um, on the subject of drawing objects or drawing, oh, probably uh, objects, when, when I do drawing workshops, one of the ways that I get people to um, capture the essence of that object in a fast, in a speedy way is to, um, you, you, you start out by drawing it as best you can in a minute or so. And then you draw it in 30 seconds. And then you draw it in 10 seconds. And then you look at those drawings, and you look at what, where did, where does it break down? What is, 
what needs to be there to communicate the essence of the thing? Like, how do, what makes a sneaker a sneaker or a tennis shoe? Or um, it's what we, we can you could relate to things in terms of iconic their iconic iconic status. Like, you the, the Eiffel Tower doesn't have to have a ton of lattice; it just needs to have its shape. Mm -hmm. And maybe there's a French flag. Yeah, <laughs> you know, like those kinds of things, right? Sometimes I'll play reductive. You know, like yes. how how few how few lines can I get away with? To, to convey something. So for example, um, sometimes just this works. Amazing, <laughs> the face. Um, sometimes I like what we were saying with the Eiffel Tower. And if we're just for fun, you can draw a guy with a beret <laughs> and a striped shirt, holding a piece of French bread. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> So just saying, have fun with it. <laughs> you, the, the go slow, go slow to go fast is to break it down to study it for a second, and then and then be able to say ah, essence of that, um, something that you can do, you know, to, to get yourself away from ah, I can't I can't draw a running horse, and actually uh, our good friend Christina Wadke said she learned that was one of the first things she learned from Ed Emberly, which is Ed Emberly is go, right then. Geared towards children, breaks down very simple things, um, skinny little, wonderful little books that you know, show you line by line in a, in a meaningful way, not like the owl. <laughs> They're just like little, thin little books. I learned how to draw yeah. from these books when I was a kid. So these are classics. Make a world. They're really fun. Yeah. And this is Christina Watkins. There's, she, she's just published this. Yeah, it's a wonderful, fabulous book. And this is somebody who said, I think drawing is important for me or my relationship with her relationship with her daughter. They have they do wonderful creations together. Uh, drawing is one of them among many. And then with her students, she's had um, an increase in engagement with her. She teaches at CCA in the Interaction Design Program, and um, people were not doing the readings, and so she asked them to create sketch notes or to do visual interpretations of the assigned readings, and she found a much greater participation. And, and engagement, so. This is also a relatively new book. It's from O'Reilly, it, um, by Ben Crothers. It specifically talks about sketching for UX design. Um, visual thinking is another book I particularly like because it not only explains some of really simple uh, icons for commonly used business concepts, but it also gives you frameworks to have discussions, which is really great, you know, like how to do, how to, how to set up, um, piece of paper to say, okay, we're going to talk about um, this journey map, or we're going to talk about this risk benefit stuff. All kinds of, you know, like, everyone's used to the four by four. Mm -hmm. He gives, this book gives a lot of different ways to shape a visual conversation in a very practical and accessible way. Based on what you're trying to address or what sort of outcomes you want to have, yeah. Versus books on how to draw a fancy owl. I'll note that both Dan Rome and Mike Rohde, whom we mentioned earlier, have um, workbooks that uh, that you draw in, that you that um, let you test out those concepts. And they're yeah. for anybody. Now, I have yet to meet somebody who has actually got a workbook and completed the workbook, or <laughs> really, really used the workbook. So I this is the, the handbook, them. and then this is the companion workbook yes. that comes with a DVD. In my experience, we are uh, the kinds of creatures that practice better when we have an accountability to be meeting someone or to be participating in an event. There are other books uh, specifically about drawing for UX and meetings. Um, the Bicabla books are fantastic. They, it's a flip book of different, how to draw different business concepts. I recommend it, but with reservations in, this, in the fact that it's only available from this company called Neuland, which is based in Germany. And if you order it, it's 20 bucks a book and 20 bucks shipping. Germany. <laughs> they have North America. They have North America. In fact, Neuland makes, um, these, these happen to be the really, really big, they call them the big ones. They make um, products for drawing um, at scale. They're um, refillable. And, and they're so they water-based, so they don't throw stink. them away. Yes, these are healthy and refillable. And they come in different sizes and different types of, of uh, tips and brushes and thicknesses and so forth. And it's still 20 bucks for shipping. Oh, well, they, <laughs> now they, they have a distribution in North America and it's, they're working on improving Germans. it. Germans. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, but they're wonderful. No, they're awesome. I have them all. They, they got me yeah. by the short hairs, I'll tell you that. Um, 
David Sibbett is a, he's the founder of the Grove Consultants. They're based in the Presidio. Um, they are basically, he's basically, I think, the father of graphic facilitation, he honestly. pretty much is. And these books are excellent um, work, excellent textbooks on how to have visual uh, conversations in meetings. And um, if for, the, for, the, for the very advanced people, uh, Dave and his new business partner and life partner uh, are uh, taking the whole visual practice into organizational development and doing some very sophisticated templating and um, like working, they're working with Marin County to um, transform the way they look at their products and services. Brandy Eigerbeck is also a fabulous graf uh, graphic facilitator and this is, I think, a great beginner's guide, a great introductory guide to what it takes to be a graphic facilitator. Um, there are schools and workshops, as we mentioned, the Grove, which is based here in the Presidio. If, while you are working for a lovely company that will pay for your education, please take a graph of the Grove. I did, it was awesome, but I wouldn't have paid for it on my own. <laughs> because they're kind of expensive. <laughs> um, Dan Rome's Napkin Academy is an online course. Um, you can take from the very beginning to very advanced. Um, Alpha Chimp is for graphic facilitation. It's, for, it's a little more advanced. Um, we both belong to this, this, this organization with this horribly unwieldy name. We just call it IFVP. Um, if, uh, it's, a, it's a group of graphic recorders, graphic facilitators, uh, UX storyboard artists, and so on. They have an annual conference. This year it's in Copenhagen. Close. Um, <laughs> it's in an, in an unpronounceable Danish city, but we're gonna go. <laughs> Damn it. <laughs> also, if you ever wanna find a graphic facilitator uh, or graphic recorder, go to this website, because they have a, a directory that's, uh, sp you can find almost in, in almost any country yes. a graphic facilitator. It's a wonderful community and people, we do refer each other. Um, there's also uh, other online and offline classes. Um, Verbal to Visual, which he showed earlier. Mm -hmm. um, he has these wonderful, these really uh, fun uh, video lessons on how to draw practically anything very simply and sketch noting. Um, Shifted Coach, this is like both in person and um, online classes for how to become a graphic facilitator or visual coach. Uh, she's based in B British Columbia. Bicablo is German. They mostly teach classes in Europe, but they occasionally come to the US to teach. And Doodle Institute is also an um, online class. So you, there's a lot of resources. Also, shameless plug, I am teaching a class uh, starting next week at Stanford Continuing Studies. I'm co-teaching with uh, James Young with, with Tangible UX. We're teaching uh, design thinking and simple sketching for UX. It's a 10-week class. It's a lot of drawing. Come and join us. And I don't have any, uh, I'm not, I don't have an, a workshop on offer, but I do have many in the bag and they are available for any size group. And remember, a few parting words. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right, and you flash back to when you were a little kid and you had the, you know, the practice. You didn't learn how to write in a day. Um, so give yourself, give yourself some credit, give yourself some slack. When, you know, just, just pick it up, try it. And then what, here's, here's the tip. Regardless, I said earlier, no, nobody's really ever completely beamingly happy with their work. They might be relieved that it's done and happy that it's providing value. When you hear that critical voice that, where you tell yourself that you're disappointed with whatever it is that you made, you can just thank that voice for sharing. And I literally think about it like a dial and say, thank you, turn it down. <laughs> Just turn the, turn the sound down on that and say, no, this is what I'm doing right now. So. Also, as I don't know how many of you are there, but I, I availed myself of the company coffee machine and made 25 copies <laughs> of this little cheat sheet. So you're welcome to help yourself to one of these if you like. And that's it. If you have any questions, we'd be happy to take them. <laughs> Hi, for those of you who haven't been here before, thank you for the audio, is uh, one at a time and with a microphone. So if you'll raise your hand and be recognized. Fred's got one mic, I've got the other. We're ready to go. Don't all raise your hands at once. Oh. <laughs> uh, well, first of all, thanks a lot. I, <laughs> I used to do this and, and I stopped. 
So this is like a lifesaver to right. be reminded of how much fun it is and kind of keeps, I don't know, it's a very interesting way of being someplace at a meeting or in a conversation. It's just great. Mm -hmm. And also I can use it with my grandkid. You know, mm -hmm. I have a little whiteboard and I, you know. So, but one thing I wanted to mention is I heard a master university professor who insisted that his, his students draw something as part of their exercise. And he said most people think that they can't draw, but he said most people have not had a lesson in drawing since about third grade. Mm. So whatever natural thing it is that happens, it kind of stops developing about that age for most, you know, unless people pursue it. So anyway, thanks again. That does make me sad when I hear about that, you know? It's, it's interesting because I, I feel really strongly about art education and when people talk about STEAM and STEM, you know, arts as well. Um, I've taught this uh, drawing class in Japan and in India, and it's funny, I, I really, I, in Japan and India, I, I feel like the, my students are much more comfortable drawing, much more, little happily drawing. They'll, they'll readily give it a try. Whereas when I teach in America, I get a higher percentage of people, oh no, I can't draw. <laughs> Which really kind of makes me sad because it's, it really isn't meant to be something on a pedestal or treated as a gift or something that only few people can do. Some people were, to were literally told, or they, they're either their, their, their representational or non-representational image was misperceived, misjudged, and they were psychologically harmed by that or they were told that they weren't any good. And, and then we moved on in our academics and drawing things isn't, it is, it's relegated to um, a, an art expression and so it doesn't stay integral with uh, the, 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 our learning um, unless you get involved in, as I did in junior high school, the architecture and drafting, it, it's still, it's a, it's a, it's a skill, skill acquisition, America is so focused on achievement and on um, acquisition of that. Yeah. Well, it's that, but it's even, it's um, being focused on something that's going to advance you, that's going to, you know, lead you toward your, your life career that you're going to excel in. And not everybody goes on to be, to do art. I, I was a musician until I hit college and then I'm not going to make a career out of being a musician, so it gets eclipsed. And so similar things happen when, when, you, when there's no structure for it and you aren't doing it uh, as a means of profession. I, mean, I, t I learned about this from, uh, about graphic facilitation from Lloyd Dangle. Uh, Lloyd Dangle is a cartoonist who used to do a, a syndicated comic called Trouble Town in, in alternative papers. He is now a full-time graphic recorder, graphic facilitator for HP. Um, and it was through a Facebook status that he did about, I took, I took a class at the Grove and now I'm doing graphic recording. He says, oh, tell me more. <laughs> and then I just went down the rabbit hole and here I am. <laughs> Hi, uh, it's a great presentation. Um, I wanted to ask you about, uh, more about storytelling and hear, th hear, hear your thoughts more from the perspective of like the content framing. Mm -hmm. uh, I have used, uh, uh, a book called uh, Resonate mm. for you know storytelling. Do you have any other suggestions like that for like when you're in a time constraint? I'm a UX researcher and usually I work in like huge time constraints. I have to like uh, present a share out or a presentation in a very quick deadline time frame. So any tips would be very helpful. You mentioned uh, understanding comics. Mm -hmm. The Scott McCloud approach to um, the way that I talked about object and refinement to its, mm -hmm. its crystallized mm -hmm. core piece, mm -hmm. he does that at a macro level in terms of storytelling and, if, and, and how to use the frame, mm -hmm. how to, or in a series of frames. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, because we didn't have, I mean, obviously you don't have time to explain the mechanics of comic mm -hmm. storytelling. Mm -hmm. I wish I could. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but that's a great resource. Um, also, Kevin Chang, who was a big yeah. speaker several years back, he wrote a book called See What I Mean. Mm -hmm. where he talks about how to do comic storytelling uh, for UX. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a, a Rosenfeld book. I think it's out of print, but it, it is readily available. Right. And, and that's a good way to go. Um, I've also, um, I also encourage people that you don't, if you want to uh, exp explain a user situation mm -hmm. or um, 
give a concept. You don't have to draw fancy pictures. Yeah. I've also um, I've also had people um, act things out and take iPhone photos, and then they draw like word balloons. This is user A. User A is looking at her phone and going, "What the hell is going on here?" Snap. So and stage it and use photos. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, that's that's really fun. That's really and that's, that's then that takes away all of the oh my god I can't draw. <laughs> um, although also you know like that noun project play thing I showed you, mm -hmm. just icons. Sometimes icons can do the trick. Yeah. Um, just even learning how to draw simple faces can yeah. do can help. Um, ah, do you have any other tips? Pardon me. Do you have any other tips? Uh, something came and came and went. Oh. <laughs> so I have one which may, I don't know if it's still current. Uh, Martin Hardy and some uh, colleagues built a website where you could uh, download the elements for telling ah, a story. Yes. What's the name of that? Do you remember? Oh, uh, there was a UX one. I yeah, remember. it was a specifically UX one uh, about you know the perspective of the user mm. as well as the system. But uh, from, in the mm. same way that you fo focused on earlier that the... Um, the imagery is not just about the system state or yes. the succession of screens, mm -hmm. but also takes into account the user's attitude toward yeah. whatever's happening and what they're seeing on the screen. Yeah. So it's a kit of parts kind yeah. of thing. Yeah. I know what I was going to mention, which is just to clarify, we're using the word comic as the format, not the content, the, the fact of comic being something funny. And um, just to some because we because we <laughs> disambiguated some of the terminology, mm -hmm. yes, of the frame by frame or story. Tell I think it. just even just learning how to draw very simple icons like this, just having people, like for example, um, I just I went I was in a meeting the other day where the user researcher basically said we have four types of users, and she showed this screen that had this table and said this user this user this user. Tiny, 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 and I thought, well, I'm, I feel for these people. <laughs> and I thought to myself, man, I, you know, I wish I could have worked with her because, like, you know, you could have done one slide per, drawn a simple person, and said, this is the treasurer, and he like this, and he like this, and he says this, yeah. and that would have been, even would have been way more compelling. <laughs> Just even putting, making a human. Even if, even if she had grabbed a, a stock photo of a man standing, it still would have been more compelling than this. And I think she did her research a disservice by pre presenting it this way, because it didn't inspire anyone to take action, or feel anything, or think, "Wow, it's hard to I see didn't know humanity. that about people." Or, "Oh my God, we got to help these people." Just saying. <laughs> Yes, so I have a few questions. Um, well, thanks for sharing tips for drawing emotions and symbol. And I recently ran into some trouble to draw some tech jargon. Uh, can I give you some challenge? Go for it. <laughs> uh, so one <laughs> is self-driving car. Second is machine learning technology, such like or artificial intelligence. Uh, a third <laughs> challenge I have is cryptocurrency, such like Bitcoin. Okay, let's try this again. Okay, okay. So, <laughs> okay, so right. it's self-driving self car. Yeah, those are. What's the th next one? Uh, machine learning. Machine learning. Uh, a Bitcoin or cryptocurrency. That's it. In the interest of time, I'm only going to let you do three. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, can we do this? Can we do this in the after? <laughs> We'll do that in the, after the. All right, because she. <laughs> uh oh, she can't hold it back. I'm I'm like so relaxed that I'm not I'm totally not up for the like the speed challenge. <laughs> Where did this take that? And if it, if I didn't make it plain earlier, uh, the drawing in front of people actually amplifies my shyness. I don't might not seem like a shy person, but. Um, ah. I don't even know. There are illustrations of it all the time in the paper. Like just a big gold coin. <laughs> yeah. Ghost money? Ghost money? Right. 
<laughs> or it can be like, like a, like, a, like imaginary oh, like a, yeah. money. <laughs> like shadow money. <laughs> I want a five thousand dollar pizza. <laughs> I heard about people paying. Sounds paying good, right? Right about like, now. Seriously, how do you get change? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Talk to us some more after, please. Thank you for your question. Hi. Um, thank you so much for the talk. It's incredible. Um, it's funny because I'm, <laughs> I'm a UX researcher right now, and I'm putting together a slide deck. Like Kishori said, we get given like, here's your collect data and tomorrow read out. Um, I'm putting together a participant panel. Actually, you know, traditionally we use a table, and I'm trying really hard not to do the whole like. And here's a bunch of bullet points about that human being. But the thing I'm coming up against, and I wonder how you deal with this trying to create an avatar or any visual representation of a person without stereotyping, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. So it's like, the woman's gonna wear a dress, that kind of thing, how do you deal with mm -hmm. that? I try to, I, whenever possible, I really, I like to try to, um, how do we put this, mix it up a lot. I try to s consciously uh, not draw the doctor as male, for example, all the time. Or try not to draw always a white guy in a hoodie. You know, who is, is the founder of a company, for example, where a guy in a suit is automatically the CTO. So the way, I mean, as far as that goes, like sometimes what I, what I, when I try to draw diversity, a lot of times that kind of comes across by either, um, and this is going to sound weird, but it's by changing the nose. <laughs> changing the nose? Yeah. Uh -huh. One thing, like, I even try to pick, like, one thing that is their distinction, like the glasses or what they're wearing. Another one is, um, like, sometimes it's like they're wearing, it's like this guy's wearing a plaid shirt, for example. Um, I actually have a, a little a set of uh, things I'll do, like, for example, sometimes I'll draw a, a a chubbier guy, like that, and then a skinnier person by changing this up. Bangs, sometimes a tree things like a hair. <laughs> Goatee, <laughs> mustache, hoodie. So I just have like this uh, repertoire of like small one or two variations that I'll do per, per character. Um, like I'll try to consciously make someone, instead of making, like I'll, I'll, like I'll listen, I'll think like what's my, what's my default for this? And I'll go, okay, turn it around. Mm -hmm. Draw an older person, draw a younger person, draw a female where you normally would have drawn a male. And so um, I, uh, I had to cut that part out of the presentation where I talk about the different variations on how to create those characters. Um, but usually like if you, the way I think about it is like pick two, two characteristics that make, make the character identifiable. So for example, with Harry Potter, he's got glasses and he's got that little lightning bolt thing, right? And then Hermione, her, her Distinguishing characteristic is her bangs and her curly hair. And then with um, Ron, his thing is he has bangs and he has freckles. And then with Dumbledore, he's got, he's older and he's got a beard and a mustache and he has that funny hat, <laughs> for example. <laughs> and then I'll just continue that throughout. So like I say, um, um, when I'm drawing like a story and it has multiple characters, I'll define the cast ahead of time. Like this character always has glasses, 
and no other character in this story has glasses. This character has a mustache. No other character in the story has glasses. I'll try to just pick one feature that I can quickly use as an identifier so that the reader can follow the journey of that particular character. Does that make sense? It does. I guess I'm just trying to make sure that I don't pick a feature that's so, you know, stereotypical. I just don't want to make the nectar of a human being into something that's I think that I think maybe the, the, I know there's a lot of sensitivity about about racial depictions, for example. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so I, I'm trying to be really conscious of that and try not to try to keep the the features. Uh, yeah. uh, how do we say this? Simple, but not exaggerated. So, for example, um, certainly drawing them is uh, a, a, an important way to to keep the things much simpler than using photography. Like drawing a hijab, for example, right? Keep it simple. Um, I try not to make people with, like, you know, something that looks, you know, disrespectful. You know, like, for example, I keep it kind of. I try to dial it down whenever possible. Um, I don't know why. I, I mean, honestly, I've never actually had that. <laughs> where people said, oh my God, that's offensive. No, as I, long as I keep it. Like it's literally cool. right now, I'm just, I have mm. you know, eight participants in this panel. I'm mm. like, okay, there's a female who's from Georgia and I know X, Y, and Z things about her. So mm. how do I visually, def like, do you know what I mean? I'm yeah. just like, I don't want to put her in a dress. <laughs> oh, you don't have to. I mean, you like, like for example, what does this woman do, for example? She owns a marketing agency. Is she, so she's a female executive? She is an executive. But I, I don't know if what she wears, because I've only spoken to her over the phone. Mm, sometimes it's like, um, you don't have to stereotypically draw the woman like that. Right. Right? I mean, this is one way to do it. Can I add in? Yes, yeah. a persona? No, this is an actual okay. human being. If it's a persona, it doesn't need to be that exact person that you spoke to. So it could be a representation also, right? Okay. It's the Sorry. <laughs> it's avoiding the table problem, mm -hmm. participant panel table Good. problem that you were just depicting because yeah. I'm like, uh, I don't want to put bullet points to can describe I, this person. Yes. Can I ask if the people who will consume your research are familiar with the subjects? Not at all. So only you know the real people who you're representing, mm -hmm. but the people who will look at the res results do not. So no. you have this liberty and you. You're saying, as I think about these live human beings, um, how do I interpret them in a way that's going to be meaningful? What, what do I choose? Yeah. Just the, okay. Okay. I guess in the in the sense of like a female, it's like um, usually like with like quick short headers, I'll draw a dress and I'll have you know put pearls or something like that. But you, in this case, like if you really feel um, the idea is like you're drawing someone, you want to show their age. So you don't want to show her as being too young, so sometimes it's like this. Like, for example. So just showing even slight age. Um, the part about like, you know, like you don't ha they don't have to necessarily have a dress. They can have like a scarf and then short hair. And then what makes the females maybe earrings or something? For example? Yeah. No, but I'm just saying that. Oh, I'm mesmerized. I'm like, I can watch you just draw <laughs> people. All this. That's but exactly I, what I want to do. Awesome. And yet, Fred is waving. Oh, yeah. Oh, Sorry. is this, is this it? <laughs> this is the. No. Thank you. Sorry. Gonna, I, have one, I have one more. Oh, and okay. It's completely different. Early on, when, when you're working with somebody, would you ever uh, draw something that, wasn't, that you didn't think was good enough to elicit a response from them? The in question, a, has words, that happened to, to me or yeah, us? Yeah, if, if you're working with another individual and you're trying to illustrate something and, and instead of, you know, and, and then just, and, and then, just not to, you know, sort of leave something out or just to elicit a response from them to get uh, the conversation going. Are we provocative going. in our choice of what we put in order to mm. 
to I guess force a response. I mean, mm. Mm, sometimes it's the narration that helps. Just like I was saying, captions help. Uh -huh. um, so sometimes, uh, if I'm at a loss of what to draw, like we were talking about the self-driving car. I mean, sometimes you just say, this is a self-driving car, because I say it is. <laughs> <Yeah>. Okay. <laughs> right. Yeah, I mean, that's what I was thinking. <laughs> Thinking but not drawing. No. Right. No, I have not uh, withheld something in order to see if somebody would say, but but there needs to be a, a something there. Just curious. Yeah. No. Actually, uh, no, because yeah. we're really we're just. What I have done is when like, uh, people start saying, but it and and then and, and so forth as I go like this. Most most people most Your times turn. it's like it's it's a car it's a self driving car because I say it is, and so like. A, it's like, okay, when we have a self-driving car, blah, 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 and then it's like, like you're, um, I am narrating and we are coming to an agreement that this is a symbol for a self-driving car. Right. Now, if someone came afterwards and saw this, and it goes, what? It's Herbie the love bug. What, yeah. is it? what is the deal with that car? <laughs> yeah. That's why you have to say, self-driving car. <laughs> and that's why we were talking about captions. <laughs> yeah. So okay. it's, like I said, it's not, I, I don't want to get people to feel like you have to draw something that is representational in order for people to understand. Sometimes it's a matter of, of even just narrating. So it's like, this is a car, <laughs> for example. As long, it's, so it's the, the voice and the narration and the action says, this is the symbol. Just like, this is the symbol for a tree. Because I say it is. <laughs> so that's why the conversation matters. And that's why captions sometimes matter. One last thing that didn't get said that's important as you go out of here thinking about drawing as an activity for any purpose. You will have a different relationship with your ideas and with other people's ideas when you draw them. When of you, course. plural, draw them. You will have an entirely different evolution of what where things go, what you think, how the conversation occurs, um, whether it's you with and for yourself, together with someone else, or in a group. You're using different parts of your brain, and it will, by the physical act of drawing something, you will have a different result than you would if you use a technological device. Thank you ever so much. And uh, I, I invite the audience to continue for a few minutes anyway with our two presenters. And let's all give a big round of uh, thanks to Deb and Jeff.